Great, so welcome everybody on behalf of the Peace and Justice Studies Association. It's my privilege and honor to introduce our keynote speaker tonight, Brandon Brown, who's closing out three months of programming provided by our organization with his talk entitled, Many Sides of Silence, Polarized Narratives as Blockades to Justice and Healing. My name is Allison Castell. I am an assistant professor of Rhetoric and Communication Studies, teaching Peace and Conflict Studies at Regis University here in Denver, Colorado. And before I get started um, with my brief introduction, so you can all focus on the main event, I would like to share Regis University's Indigenous Land Acknowledgements. Regis University recognizes that Indigenous peoples are the original stewards of the land we stand on today. We respectfully acknowledge that this land is the traditional homeland and buffalo hunting grounds of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute nations. We also recognize the 48 tribal nations that are historically tied to the lands that make up the state of Colorado. As a Jesuit university, Regis is engaged in a mission of walking with those communities who have been excluded. Accordingly, it is important that we acknowledge that our presence on this land is due to the forced displacement of indigenous peoples from their ancestral lands. It is only in publicly recognizing this historical reality that we are able to embrace in the present our moral and intellectual responsibility and to affirm our commitment to a faith that does justice. In order to honor the original inhabitants of this land and to enter into right relationship with their descendants, Regis will continuously reimagine this acknowledgement, act on our responsibilities to the common good, and respectfully collaborate with and support members of local indigenous communities. The Peace and Justice Studies Association is guided by ethics and principles of inclusion and strives to be a place not only for hearing from traditional scholars, but for privileging voices and stories that often go unheard. For me, this emphasis has provided a depth of meaning and a sense of community that I have not experienced in other academic and professional organizations. And it is here that I and many of my colleagues have found a place to explore critical issues, but also cultivate hope and solidarity, a community creation especially needed during these days of enduring isolation. These past three months, our virtual program has brought people from all over the globe to engage in critical conversations around restorative justice, storytelling and social justice, and this month polarization. I would be remiss if I did not thank our conference committee members, the presenters, the attendees, and our wonderful cadre of student interns for making this possible. Tonight is extraordinary as our speaker, Brandon Brown, is joining us from Baldock Correctional Facility. I'd like to personally thank the leadership there, especially the assistant director, for their support of Brandon's participation in tonight's event. It is not every day that you are asked to trailblaze, and we are so grateful for your willingness to do so. I am thrilled to be able to introduce Brandon, whom I met in April of this year when I attended his thesis defense and was flooded with awe inspiration for his journey. In the past seven months, he and I have cultivated a relationship over our shared commitment and love for narrative justice and conflict resolution, and even had the opportunity to have him visit my first year writing class on storytelling and social justice. It is so fitting that Brandon is speaking tonight as we bring to close these three months of programming as his story, his scholarship, and his vision lies at the intersection of our three themes. I would like to read Brandon's bio um, just to give you a sense of his history. And um, I, I know that he's really looking forward to a Q&A after this. So please um, come with your questions and uh, feel free to put them in the chat. And if you wanna put your name next to it so that we might be able to call on you um, after this, that, that'd be great. So here's his formal bio. Brandon Brown received both his Associate and Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Maine in Augusta while confined to a maximum security prison. After realizing his passion for learning and storytelling, he was introduced to restorative justice through a workshop offered inside the prison, which compelled him to pursue his master's degree in conflict analysis and resolution with an emphasis on the intersections of narrative and justice. 
becoming the first person in Maine to complete a graduate degree while incarcerated and leading to his enrollment in the doctoral program at George Mason University's newly named Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution. Possibly the first incarcerated student in the US to receive approval to conduct human subject research inside of a prison, Brown's research documents, analyzes, and explores the narratives of current prisoners with, within the facility where he was housed for nearly 11 years. This groundbreaking work dives into the authentic voices of incarcerated men, uncovering themes around narrative suppression and the expectations of silence arising from a diverse group of participants, uncovering what he terms the violence of silence and what happens when human voice is almost completely suppressed. Brandon hopes to advance the utilization of narrative theories of conflict resolution across a wide spectrum of conflict scenarios and contexts, including social justice and advocacy and activism around issues of mass incarceration and the United States history of systemic violence. It is my honor and my privilege to pass over the mic to Brandon Brown. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Castell. And uh, thanks everybody for joining in tonight. This is a really big honor for me and a huge shout out and thanks to the Peace and Justice Studies Association for their willingness to have me as a presenter today. Um, you know, and, and especially to be the closing speaker and presenter, that's, that's an honor that I really can't put words to, but it's something that I feel very deeply um, have a lot of gratitude for that. And so I have a lot of gratitude for everybody who's joining today as well. Um, this is just a great chance for me to talk about my research and to talk about it to a group of people who are thinking about, you know, issues of peace and justice and, and what those things look like. And it's especially compelling to think about the structure of the three months of the conference that have been going on and the presentations that have been happening and the questions that are being, you know, that are being asked of everybody that's tuning into those presentations. So thank you again for, for the introduction, Allison, and thank you everybody for uh, joining today. And I hope that through my presentation, you know, we will generate some rich conversation and some questions, um, you know, like, like Dr. Castell said. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here and bear with me for one moment. Is that good? Everybody can see that? All right, great. So I'm just gonna jump right in and say, um, like, like Allison said, uh, the title of my presentation today is Many Sides of Silence, Polarized Narratives as Blockades to Justice and Healing. And I just wanna give a little bit more background about myself before I jump into it. Um, you know, I've, I've been in prison for a pretty long time. I was arrested at the age of 21 and I've been confined since 2009 and I do remain incarcerated, um, although I'm at a minimum security facility now. And like Allison said, I was very fortunate to begin my college experience with uh, UMaine Augusta um, at the very beginning of my prison sentence. Uh, it was less than nine months before I started my first ever college classes. And I just want to pay homage and, and say thank you to the late Doris Buffett, who without her, I wouldn't be here today. Um, it was her philanthropy and it was her generosity that allowed me to get my associate's degree and my bachelor's degree through her Sunshine Lady Foundation. And that foundation of going through the process of you know, college education while in prison, it led me down that road, like Allison said, to eventually pursuing a master's degree specifically in conflict analysis and resolution. And so I, I wanna say that, you know, my interests and my passions have been driven by my formative experiences within the system. And as I've gone through the master's program and graduated in, in um, spring of this year, and, and now I'm in my first semester of the doctoral program at George Mason, I, I've had this overarching question that has really driven my work and continues to drive my work. And the question is pretty simple, right? It's just, what do we want from our systems of justice and the institutions that compromise them? And how do we get there? Meaning, how do we get to those goals that we set out? So that's been the formative question for me that I've, that I've aimed at exploring, obviously not in the big picture, but paring it down as I become um, more knowledgeable about the theories that I'm, that I'm studying. And so, you know, like she said, I had a passion for restorative justice that I really wanted to pursue after um, obtaining my bachelor's degree. And 
What I wanted to explore was this possibility of a criminal system that's built on restorative principles. But what I found was that there's very limited options for graduate education, specifically in restorative justice as a curriculum, and even more so for somebody in my position who, who is incarcerated. So what I did was I searched Google, right? I, I looked up the top 10 graduate programs in restorative justice. And what I got was a whole bunch of information on conflict resolution and international relations. And so when I looked into that, conflict analysis and resolution seemed to be an approach that would allow me to explore some of these same issues I was interested in from a restorative perspective, but also showed me that I could explore the roots um, to these wider systemic issues that our country faces when it comes to criminal justice and mass incarceration. So then I arrived at this, this narrative perspective, right? This approach um, about the narrative uh, approach to conflict analysis and resolution. And I kind of arrived here or the beginning of my journey to narrative was during my first semester, I was introduced to this concept that stories and narratives are really foundational to every conflict. And that from the interpersonal perspective, the international perspective, there are stories to be told about a conflict, right? Each side of a conflict or sometimes multiple sides of conflicts, there, there's a story about the origin, but there's also a story about people's continuing roles in that conflict. And where those stories diverge is oftentimes what can drive continued conflict. And that can be, you know, from a very small level, but also to like a protracted violent level, this idea of what narratives are at play is a very important thing to, to assess. So merging or bridging those stories, what it does is it provides us as conflict practitioners and, and conflict resolvers, it, it provides us an opportunity to create better form stories. And so a bridging narrative, and this is a quote from Sarah Cobb, who's a very important mentor to me, but I also know a very, uh, very important mentor to Dr. Castell as well. And so she says that a bridging narrative is one that is developed to bridge different segments of the storyline. It, um, it provides context for connecting portions of the plot that seemingly are unrelated. Bridging narratives provide links between otherwise disparate or mutually disqualifying narratives. And that's a really important thing to consider moving through the presentation, this idea of creating bridging narratives, because I think what my hunch is, is that in the realm of criminal justice, that's a very difficult task to achieve. So, but with that being said, these concepts can be applied to the pursuit of justice within our system. But what it does is it requires us to consider the way that narrative is at play in the system and the way that these narrative forces might be destructive but also the possibility that better form stories might be a necessary approach when we think about achieving justice within the criminal system. And, and to say that really requires a prerequisite that better form narratives require complexity, right? We have to move away from these overly simplistic narratives and the stock plots that come with them and the roles that are assigned to people within those narratives. And within the system that we have right now of criminal justice, that's kind of a foundational part of it, these, um, simplistic narratives and roles. And that's something that I'll discuss kind of later on in the presentation. So we get to my thesis here and the title of my thesis is Stories from the Inside, an exploration into prisoner narrative identity and the violence of silence. And I just wanna kind of give a caveat to something that was said in the introduction. I, I've tried very hard to find other instances where people who are currently incarcerated were able to conduct research within a prison that they were currently housed in. And I found some instances that I'll kind of speak about the types of research that I've done, but what I wasn't able to find, and I enlisted a lot of people to help me with this search, what I wasn't able to find was somebody that, that gained approval to do human subjects research, to actually interview people within the facility, and then do an analysis of, the, of that data that they gained while still incarcerated. And when I set out on this research, I, I really, you know, I wasn't sure how difficult the journey was going to be. I wasn't sure what the approval processes were going to be like, but I knew that I wanted to gather some data from the people that I was surrounded by, from the men that I was experiencing incarceration with, and, and especially from a diverse group of men to try to make sense about the experience of imprisonment from a narrative perspective, try to make sense of the stories that we tell each other, that we tell ourselves, and the way that we see those stories being told on our behalf. And so that's really the, the, foundation of what I'm speaking about is this opportunity to gain, you know, I don't, I don't want to say authentic, I want to say unguarded, right, to gain unguarded access to people's stories, because they're talking to somebody who's experiencing their everyday with them, 
So there's a level of trust that of trust that's built there to kind of offer up stories that maybe weren't wouldn't be offered up to other people. So that's the background about my thesis. And essentially, when I was thinking about conducting the study, you know, there were some considerations that I was making. And the first one is that I've found throughout my incarceration um, that the majority of what's written about uh, what's written about prisons and prisoners is one of two things. The first one is, you know, autoethnography, which is just this firsthand account of somebody's personal experiences of being incarcerated, usually written after they get out of prison, but not always. Right. And the other the other issue that I identified was this idea of an outsider's view. And when I say outsiders, I, I don't mean to separate uh, good guys and bad guys. Right. I don't mean to separate um, good researchers and bad researchers. What I mean to do is say that an outsider is just somebody who doesn't have experience with incarceration. So a good majority of what's written is written by those researchers. And it's based on observations they've made or data they've collected while making those observations inside of a prison environment, you, you know, talking to people or just observing. And so these issues, they, they pose some, um, some barriers in my opinion. And the first one with autoethnography is that it's hard to capture voice beyond the narrator, right? The story being presented is a single interpretation and it's based on that one individual's understanding of their experience of other people that they've witnessed and what, you know, what they've seen, what they've noted. And the other one is that outside researchers, although you know very much capable and trustworthy, and I've met some phenomenal researchers who have come into the prison where I was, but what I also became acutely aware of is that those individuals will find it very hard to obtain these unguarded accounts, and that's just because of the nature of the system that creates distrust between prisoners and outsiders. So when I was considering the opportunity to do human subjects research and the difficult journey that that would pose versus doing a thesis that maybe didn't require that type of data collection. I really say to myself, I have to move forward with this because of the unique opportunity that, it, that, that is being provided to do this research that possibly hasn't been done before. So, you know, prisoners also I've found are not represented in the world of academia, specifically as researchers. You're not going to find a lot of information out there that kind of tells the story of prisoners as researchers. And I've always found that a little bit ironic because I believe that prisoners as researchers is an opportunity to conduct research that can contribute to our understanding about how complex these systems are. And I, I say these systems and I mean from arrest to release and even beyond right, to empower the prisoner voice, I feel like is an important consideration to make because we get an opportunity to find more complex and more sophisticated versions and analyses of what the prisoner experience is like by, you know, propelling people to that position. And so what I believed is that by conducting these interviews, I had access to more honest stories, but more importantly, I had access to the, con the context of these stories. Right, a lot of the things that were being discussed, I've been, oh, give me one second. I don't, I'm just gonna leave that alone. <laughs> I hope that this computer doesn't restart because that would be tragic. If it does, I'll rejoin, but I'm not sure what to do about this. Should I click snooze here? Well, that won't, okay. All right, I apologize for that. I'm, I'm not the greatest with technology, so. <laughs> Um, you know, I, so what I was saying was that more importantly, I had access to the context of these stories, right? And what I hoped was that this context and this level of access would provide me a more vivid account, specifically in the analysis portion of my study, about what these stories were saying as a collective versus what each individual was saying, because it was very important to get the individual perspectives, but it was more important to establish what that collective story was in, in the hopes that maybe it could, you know, contribute to some, some necessary change that needs to happen within the system. Oh. So what I've got here is a slide about the violence of silence specifically, because this is the, um, this is the theme that I'm, I'm going to speak about today, right? There was a, there was quite a few themes that came out of my research and I think they all have, um, merit to them to be discussed, but I think in, in this context and, and for this conference, what I really wanted to speak about was this idea of the violence of silence. And it was the major finding of my research. And I wanna point out that it was the major finding because it was something that was completely unanticipated by me. I had no idea going into this 
that this was going to be something that came out of the study. And, and essentially, the reason it came about, the reason that I, I guess I, I stumbled upon this as a theory is there was like unanimous stories about how the forces of silence were damaging the way that the, the participants viewed themselves, but it was also damaging the prospects of becoming more than the master narrative that they were describing, right? The stereotypical view of who they were from, from numerous forces, you know, from within the prison, from outside the prison, from their peer groups, from the, um, from the staff and the administration. And as I was going through the analysis, this silence, it not only equated to narrative violence, but I also found that there was some pretty, there was some significant consensus that it could also lead to physical violence as an act of reclamation, right? And I've offered this quote here on this slide because it really captures this theme better than the rest of the quotes, but there was numerous other quotes that also contributed to this theme. But this one is the most important one. And this gentleman said during our interview that many of the negative experiences in here force you to go to the extreme in order to just be heard. Taking my voice away makes me feel violent because violence will always get results. And so this was something that one of the participants offered up to me. And as I was going through the data and analyzing it, this jumped out at me because it made sense. It's supported by a lot of theory in the field of conflict analysis and resolution, specifically in the narrative realm, right? Sarah Cobb, my mentor has also written that when, when words no longer work, violence is the only option. So as I heard these men's stories and I heard them speak about, you know, either the actual act of committing violence or just the thought process of it, they were describing that as a result of the silence and the oppressive, like the oppressive silence that they were experiencing. And so to just kind of, to kind of frame this here, the silence of violence, according to Sarah Cobb, Narrative violence refers to both the disruption of narrative, but also within the context of conflict, the institutionalization of exclusion. And, and this is something important to think about because physically it's, it's not difficult to imagine prisoners as an excluded population. I mean, we physically erect barriers around them and those barriers are layered, right? There's walls, there's fences, there's barbed wire. Usually prisons are put in, um, you know, in the middle of nowhere you know, separate, creating a, a means of separation that's, that's quite large. But there's also, it's also important to imagine this idea of exclusion beyond the physical separation, right? It's very difficult to communicate with prisoners. It's expensive for prisoners to communicate even with their communities and their loved ones. And it's nearly impossible to get narratives of prisoners out to society at large. So their exclusion in many ways has been institutionalized from the physical level to the narrative level. And, and like I said in the last slide, violence is the only recourse when words no longer work. So here, during my, during my data collection, prisoners spoke a lot about the ways that words don't work, right? The ways that words didn't matter because they were either rarely given the opportunity to express words and stories and opinions specifically to those with power and control over them, you know, the staff and the administration within the system, but also beyond that, that one group. And so there was consensus about the belief that society had this overly stigmatized view of the prisoner, right? That society subscribed to this idea of the master narrative of who a prisoner is, or that to society, the master narrative didn't matter because prisoners were completely invisible to them. And so with the, with this overly stigmatized view or this invisibility, there was really no opportunity for people to feel like they could offer a more complex or a more sophisticated story that was rooted in more than just the mistake they made, right? These stereotypes about that mistake and these stereotypes about who are held in prisons have flooded the societal consciousness so much that it's left a lot of people in prisons feeling helpless that there's the ability to become more than that master narrative. And so what I did when I was thinking about what this data meant was I broke down the violence of silence into two overarching categories, right? Forced silence, and, and it's probably better to say silence through coercion, right? This is the view that staff within the prison expect inmates to be voiceless and that they will possibly punish those who don't comply. And then there was silence and invisibility, which was the recognition from the men that I spoke to that not only does society not want to hear about inmates, but that one dimensional representations offered through media and pop culture were so widely accepted and so you know, naturally held 
that this this belief that getting to the truth of who a human being was in prison was impossible. And so I want to point out that I'm not, these are not assessments that I'm making, right? These are themes that arose from the narrative of prisoners, which is really important to consider about what that means, because the way people frame their narratives is the way they frame their reality. And so we have to do narrative work to get people to a new reality about who they are and what's possible. And so for the prisoner, they've effectively become invisible to society at large based on the interviews that I did. And they're contending with these coercive forces in terms of narrative on the inside. And so what I've done here is I'm not gonna read all of these, right? But I just wanted to offer up on the screen some ideas of the specific quotes that the men were, were giving me during the interviews. And I've, I've removed portions of some of these quotes because some, you know, some of these things were, um, there was a lot of vulgar and violent and dehumanizing language within these quotes, which I think is necessary to think about why that may be the case. I don't believe that it's just because prisoners or the culture is overly vulgar and overly violent, but I believe that when I asked the men about what they thought staff expected from them, that there was this idea that they were, in the eyes of staff, they believed less than human. And I think the response that that elicited was sometimes, you know, some people had very vulgar responses to that. And so I, I removed these portions just, you know, because it, I don't want this presentation to be about that. I don't want people to get distracted, but I do want to make sure that people understand just to give credit to the men that I spoke with, that there was this feeling of dehumanization and this very overarching frustration that led to some, you know, some pretty, some pretty, um, some, some tough statements to swallow, right? And just to give an idea here, this first one, you know, a gentleman said, how do I put this? They expect you to be sheep, do what I say, when I say, how I say. You're not even allowed to have an opinion or a voice at all. And then if we just skip down some towards the end here, one gentleman said, sit, sleep, and bark when they say so. That's what they expect. And for context, the they is the staff. The question I ask is, what do you believe staff expect from you? So then this last one is interesting to consider, right? This gentleman said, they expect people to be complete prisoners. Do what you're told, no matter what, with no question. And so for a prisoner to use the term complete prisoners is an interesting overarching thing to consider because for him and for many of the participants, the idea of a complete prisoner meant being suppressed from a narrative perspective, not having voice, not having the opportunity to have an opinion or a story, or even for that matter, engage in dialogue about a, pretty much anything, right? So I, I, I included this one quote to capture the theme of invisibility and silence. And, and this gentleman said, I don't really think there are expectations. And the question I asked was, what do you think people on the outside think of you? And what this guy said was, people would rather see us locked up and throw away the key, like if they never come out, we don't have to think about them. They believe what they see on TV, they just don't have a clue. They just believe we get what we deserve. Why would they have any other expectations? They don't see any positive, not guys getting educated, not men reading books or truly committing to change. And what this quote does for me and why I chose it for today is it really captures the layers of the silence that the men were expressing, right? It's not just that I, that I as a prisoner don't have the opportunity to offer a story, offer a narrative to you. It's that the narrative that's being offered to society is really painting a picture of the prisoner as this one, strictly one thing. And even when an opportunity presents itself to society to reframe a, a prisoner and repaint them in a more positive light, they've been so inundated with the negative image that the, you know, the quote unquote positive one is easily swept away by the flood of negativity. And so what a lot of guys said is, how are people supposed to see us as something different if they don't have the opportunity to? And that's where this issue of invisibility and silence is at play. So, you know, this question I asked when I was thinking about what the research meant is how does silence affect the end? And in the immediate, it was really apparent that it affects the inmate by creating hopelessness and anger and resentment. And like we discussed at the beginning, it caused inmates to seek out alternative ways to be heard. And in the environment, there's not a lot of positives way, positive ways to be heard. 
the majority of them are overly negative and oftentimes physically violent, right? So the silence also is directly responsible for the creation of an us versus them culture within prison. And that's not just us versus them in terms of inmates versus staff. It's also us versus them in terms of inmates versus society. And it can even lead to us versus them in terms of inmates and inmates, right? It's, there's a very um, hyper separated dynamic within prisons where groups, and this was another part of my research that I don't speak about at length today, but I asked men about the groups that they're in. What pulls you towards one group and what pushes you away from another group, right? What is it about the men that you're close to that, that makes you feel close to them? And so this idea of silence also created pockets of us versus them culture within the prison and amongst the inmate population. And so what that leads to, and there's a lot of data and there's a lot of research and there's a lot of literature that, that paints this scene, is that people who are overly stereotyped and stigmatized for long enough periods of time, it leads them to accepting and even embracing those master narratives and stereotypes as a coping mechanism, right? Which then leads to the perpetuation of that. And so when we look at things in the long term, what the inmates expressed was that there was a belief that they had been reduced to these master narratives, even after release. So when I spoke to the men about, you know, what, what do you think about when you think about getting out? Do you think these things will affect you in a different way? And this hopelessness and the anger and the resentment, these immediate effects also had lingering effects for when people thought about their futures beyond the walls. And what that effectively does is that silencing and that frustration, it leads to a road of failure, more likely than not. And when, you, when I spoke with the men, it was as if they were already preparing themselves to fail because of these narrative forces that they were up against. And one of those things was that people felt that there was a need to hide entire segments of their story, right? Which is another byproduct of the violence of silence, right? That people are silencing portions of their own narrative and creating portions of invisibility within their narrative because of the fear that they have about sharing those aspects of their life, even if it meant not telling somebody that prison was a positively formative experience for them. And that's a really, really important thing to consider about what that means. And so another thing that men spoke about was that they were coping through destructive means, which essentially is fueling recidivism. And so with, when we think about what all this means in the big picture, we know that recidivism can mean perpetuated harm. Somebody comes in for a crime, experiences the system, gets out, commits more crimes. So if we have this roadmap to what silence is doing to fuel recidivism, then it's incumbent on us as you know, professionals, researchers, teachers, or justice personnel to really think about the way that we can make positive change to these narrative aspects in order to reduce recidivism. So when I asked what this all meant, you know, the overarching story, I drew on a lot of literature from the field, right? This belief that people are the stories that they tell and that those stories are influenced by these narratives. And so in order to move past these narratives, there has to be the possibility of new, better stories to be told. So when I was thinking about it, what really became apparent to me that when, it was that when silence becomes a mechanism of oppression or a byproduct of a system, the narrative violence occurs. And for the prisoners specifically, the narrative violence can and does lead to physical violence and cycles of violence, both within the walls and beyond. And the more that I thought about this and the more that I analyzed the data and the more that I read the literature, this became really apparent that this is not something that's unique to prison. It's a, it's a symptom of conflict in general. And so viewing prison, viewing criminal justice, viewing crime as a conflict has some really important implications because it allows us to frame how narrative might be a tool for lessening conflict, lessening recidivism, and lessening the violent experiences inside and outside of prisons for the prison. So essentially silence is making the possibilities of peace and resolution or justice very difficult to achieve. Right, and this, this uh, image that I've created here, it's basically when you take narrative violence, when you take structural violence, right, which the, the, you know, the system of imprisonment, the system of punishment, this is a system of structural violence. It's a system that's meant to dehumanize, it's designed to separate, to isolate, and you know, to punish. That's the purpose of the system from its original intent, right? And so we've grown 
you know, we've grown to believe that we need a new purpose, but we're still using the same system that we created with this intent. So then when you throw silence in the mix, what you get out of this funnel is cycles of harm, physical violence, and recidivism like we spoke about. But it's also important to think about the way that structural violence plays a role before somebody ever experiences incarceration, right? Because structural violence in marginalized communities can lead to astronomical rates of imprisonment. So somebody can experience structural violence and narrative violence before they even ever even commit a crime, before they ever even come to prison. And then all of that is exacerbated by the process of incarceration, leading to more structural violence, more narrative violence, and now a new level of silence, ultimately leading to these really negative outcomes. So when I was thinking about what all this meant and when I was thinking about presenting here, what I really started to think about is considering silence beyond the walls of the prison. What does this mean for society at large? What does this mean for other conflicts, or what does this mean for the criminal justice system as a whole, not just the process of incarceration, right? How is silence beyond the environment perpetuating this type of violence and blocking concepts that are really important to our pursuit of justice? Like I said in the beginning, this is my overarching question when I think about the work that I want to do. So I, I really started to think about how silence is already built in, right? So we have this concept that one has the right to remain silent. And not to underscore this, because this is a really important protection, right? It protects the ideal that individuals are innocent until proven guilty. So it's a constitutional protection and it's something that I'm not suggesting we do away with, but at the same time, I wanna recognize that it's there. And so the question I have is what does that concept say about the wider system? And the answer I get is that if resolution to crime involved more than punishment, then I wonder what the need for remaining silent would be. When you think about why somebody remains silent in the process, it's out of a fear typically, right? I fear that I'm gonna get punished if I don't try to argue this case, if I don't try to say that I'm not responsible for whatever the crime was, or if I don't try to diminish my responsibility. And obviously that's very specific to people who are guilty. I'm not talking about people who are genuinely innocent of the crimes they're accused of, but I really wanna think about people who are inevitably gonna to go to prison and I wanna think about the way that, how is silence detrimental to the process, right? And the answer to that question for me is that punishment is the overarching purpose of the system. So when silence is embedded into our systems, it makes justice a competition, right? It makes there need to be a winner and a loser as opposed to making justice something that's mutually beneficial to all parties. And so silence is effectively preventing us from finding mutually beneficial outcomes. And so the opposite of silence was something that I'm thinking about as well, right? In our current system, the accused is afforded this protection, but what about the accuser or the victim, right? This is an interesting dichotomy that we have. The victim is forced into voice, which can be very traumatizing, right? The victim is forced to confront the silence of the accused in order to convince juries and judges, police and lawyers, the gatekeepers of justice, that a harm has occurred. So what we have is a system that's encouraging silence on one end, but disallowing si silence on another. And that's a very interesting dichotomy to think about what that means for the process. So this idea that victims don't have the ability to be silent because without a complaint, without their testimony, there can often be no harm, right? And, and I'm not gonna get into the, spe the specifics of state law because that's not always the case. But essentially what we're saying is that justice depends on the absence of silence, even when retelling that story can act as a form of trauma. So the, the question that I have to everybody is how do we work towards something that where that re-traumatization, right? Where that destructive outcome is possibly not the outcome, right? How do we get to a space within criminal justice where we we don't promote silence on one side and we don't and we don't force voice on another, but we promote something that's more in the middle where we're promoting everybody to have a story and to tell that story. And this is a this is a bedrock of restorative justice. So another thing that I wanted to draw attention to is this idea that victims are also a very stigmatized population, right? Too often the system tosses aside victims after what we say is justice has been achieved. So I've been thinking about the violence of silence and how that activates in the victim, right? 
we, we, we encourage victims to suppress this narrative of harm that they've gone through because we also typecast and stereotype and label them as helpless victims. And so I'm interested in thinking and exploring further the way that narrative violence occurs, not just for the offender, but for many stakeholders in the realm of criminal justice, right? So narrative violence is likely to occur at multiple levels and it becomes this double-edged sword that the system has created. And it's specifically been created because we're not thinking about resolution because we're so preoccupied with punishment. And so if punishment is leading to a lack of peace, then we have to agree that we have an obligation to rethink what punishment is doing and what the purpose of the system is. So just as an interesting framing exercise, thinking of crime versus conflict, right? When we frame something as a crime, the desired outcome is justice and not necessarily peace. And these two things are not mutually exclusive. They're not always the same. If we consider that crime is a conflict, then it is incumbent on us to consider both justice and peace. So when you're working towards peace, you have to ask the question, you have to ask it explicitly, what does peace look like? And those harmed experience healing by having their immediate and long-term needs met, right? That's, that's peace. Responsible parties or offenders learn accountability, experience reintegrative shame, rehabilitation, and successful reintegration. That's peace because it's not leading to cycles of recidivism. So when we, when we frame it like this, peace seems to be parallel to those outcomes that are sought in restorative justice processes. And I think that's an important thing to just give credit to. It's not like some original idea I came up with. This is an idea that exists at multiple levels of conflict resolution and other justice related processes. But I also wanna talk about where restorative justice may fall short. So restorative justice, I believe, correctly centers practices on the need for all voices and stakeholders to be Restorative justice also requires opportunities for equity and voice. And a critique of this process is that a lack of understanding how marginalized voices have experienced institutionalized and systemic forces of silence. And another way of saying that is restorative justice has in many times and in many instances been co-opted um, you know, through white privilege and through Western forms of what it looks like, what justice looks like, what restoration looks like versus the original forms, the indigenous forms that restorative justice was built upon. So it's very difficult to achieve restorative justice outcomes if we're not being honest with and understanding how marginalized people have experienced institutionalized forces of silence, right? But also restorative justice assumes that equity is achievable. And I don't believe that that's the case in, in all scenarios. For instance, in our current system, power dynamics might be too strong to believe that all voices will feel safe enough not to be silenced. So this is the source of a lot of debate about restorative justice as a replacement to criminal justice or even restorative justice as a supplemental process. But it's also, um, I think, a positive critique of why restorative justice can exist as an independent process because it, it lessens those power dynamics by not pulling in people from all of these coercive like police lawyers, right? True restorative justice comes at the level of equitable voice. So to get there, we have to really consider how power is, is at play. And so this next section here, the question is, why, why is silence a blockade to justice and peace? And so my belief is that any system that begins with these polarized narratives, like the criminal justice system, where we have voice and voiceless, where we have accused and accuser, we have the need for a winner and a loser, Right, So when we have these polarized narratives, what we're going to do is we're going to potentially systematize silence. And what I mean by that is we're going to potentially create avenues for silence to become necessary or for people to feel that it's necessary. And so without story and without narrative and voice, truth telling and resolution, they can become mirages in this desert of conflict and harm. They can become these ideals that we claim to be working towards but effectively, we're, because with the system we've, we've created, we're working against voice and truth telling and story. So, you know, we all know that stories cannot exist without empowering people to tell them. And so any vision of achieving justice requires the opportunity for stories to be told. And that's the story of harm from numerous perspectives, which is another thing that restorative justice draws upon that is very important. But when silence is embedded into our system, what it does is it encourages this polarization, but it also instills animosity. 
right? It, it instills feelings of animosity between those who are being silenced and those who might need to hear their stories but aren't getting access to those stories because of the way the system is creating silence. So the animosity can lead to destructive forms of silence for victims and offenders alike, but it, al it also can normalize the institutionalization of silence within our culture and perpetuate cycles of harm. And that's what I was speaking about earlier, right? People carrying those, um, that feeling of being silenced beyond the walls, victims carrying the, the feeling of needing to stay silent about their experience beyond the courtroom after justice has been doled out. And so a truly healthy system, in my opinion, would be built on story, it would be built on voice, and it would effectively try to eliminate silence because there's an understanding that for healing to occur, stories must be told, and hard truths must be confronted, right? So again, uh, another framing exercise here, criminal justice versus peace processes, and I've included restorative justice in those processes. The criminal approach offers the right to remain silent. There's a need for a winner or a loser. There's an assigning of guilt and punishment. And what I mean by that is there's not necessarily an acceptance of guilt and punishment. We just assign those things, usually without actually having people accept those, those designations. And there's institutionalized and what I call weaponized silence following the outcome. And the reason, I, the reason I say weaponized, number one is for dramatic effect to get people thinking about it, but also really to think about the way that we're intentional with how we're silencing some populations, in this case, specifically prisoners. It's not an accident, it's, it's not an accidental outcome, right? But the system is built on silencing these voices. And you know, there's a belief that for the system to work effectively, silence is a necessity. Now with peace, when we're searching for peace, we establish processes for stories about the conflict to be told, where all sides are heard, and where truth is encouraged as, and peace is the goal. And we have myriad examples of this, right? Truth and Reconciliation Commission of all different kinds have been erected throughout the world that have explored this idea of truth and story. We seek bridging narratives in peace processes that lead to better formed stories, right? We seek to have people from both ends of the conflict find these bridges towards each other's narrative to make sense of the experiences that they've had within the conflict. And also we have a collective discussion on needs and post-conflict sanctions and what sustainable peace will require and what it would look like. And so when I when we think about these things, it's important to really you know bring up this last point, which is on the peace side, narrative exists at every level, and silence is is tried to be pushed out. But on the criminal justice side, it's quite the opposite. Silence is almost encouraged at multiple levels, and narrative and story, the opportunities for them are few and far between. So. I, I want to speak about another aspect of my research that's really important, right? This, what I say is proof that voice matters and what I consider as a roadmap for the future. So during the course of this research, there was something that was incredibly surprising that happened and, and what I feel is quite special, right? I asked participants a question about halfway through each interview. And that question was very simple. Are there situations when you feel that you are treated as an individual as opposed to just one of the and the responses to these were not what I expected. Going into the research, you know, largely framing it through my own experience, I thought that people would say things like when I have visits with my family or when I speak with my children on the phone or when I'm listening to music or when I'm doing these exercises that take my mind out of the environment, then I feel more like a human and I forget about what I face as a prisoner, right? That's not what I experienced with the responses. Many of these men, they recalled stories about when staff treated them with dignity and respect, and they spoke to how meaningful that experience was. And the, probably the most powerful part was that when the men told these stories, the, the, the effect that it had on them, it wasn't just obvious in the words itself, in themselves, right? Their posture changed, their tone of voice changed. Some of them became emotional when they told these stories. And when I asked them about what was making them emotional, they realized that these were really important stories that were part of their narrative about how they understood their experience, right? Some of this like machismo posture that can exist inside of prisons as a, as a self-defense mechanism, that was shedded when these stories were told. And a, and a new, you know, a new posture came about when they were recalling these, these experiences. 
And so I wanted to draw on three quotes really to give you all the context of what I'm talking about here. So this first one is a gentleman who said, I feel human anytime staff relates to me through artistry. One officer even asked me for drawing tips one time and he was being very genuine and he treated me like an artist instead of an inmate. And so the question that I wanna to pose to you is this idea of an artist instead of an inmate, what is that? Well, it's narrative complexity. Right? It's the elimination of single one-dimensional stories about who an inmate is, and it's adding what could be seen as a very simple layer to that narrative, right? something that to most people might not even be meaningful. But this idea that an inmate could be more than just a prisoner and also be treated as an artist was incredibly important for this man when he told me the story. Another gentleman, and you know, I apologize for the length of this quote, but it's important to capture what he was saying, right? He said, there was one time when I was working as a cleaner and I got called down to the SMU, which is segregation, at like two in the morning to clean up a bunch of feces. One of the officers that was working down there pulled me aside after and told me that he couldn't believe how long I've been doing this job for and that he was always impressed that I never complained and always showed up with a good attitude, even for something like this. It was in the middle of the night and when I finally finished, he offered me some Girl Scout cookies and said that I could have them, but I had to eat them there before I was escorted back to my cell. Just that little thing made me feel like I wasn't in prison for a few minutes, like I had value. This guy gave me cookies and he could have been fired for it, but he appreciated me enough to do it anyway. That really meant a lot to me. It felt good to be treated like a person. Now, this is, this is, a, this is a paragraph, right? But this is a whole entire story that we should consider because there's some elements of this that are important. Right, what this, what this person was, describe, was describing was a simple act of kindness that an officer extended to him just for doing his job, right? This was the inmate's job. He, when, he, when he signed up for the job, he knew that this was part of the job. And what this staff person did was he said, I really respect the way that you have a positive attitude. That also is narrative complexity. You're not just the prisoner and all the stereotypes that, that I as a staff person feel might come with that. You're also this hardworking, positive individual, and I'm gonna extend this simple act of kindness to you, even though it could get me in trouble. Now, the other question that I have that we should consider about our systems is why would a simple act of kindness get somebody in trouble? Now, this is a whole nother narrative and a whole nother story that needs to be addressed, is the role of, of officer and the role of inmate and what those roles designate, what they require. Right, because what this gentleman was saying with his response was that they require not to have simple acts of kindness and gestures of humanity. And I think that's a really important thing for us to consider when we think about what our prisons are for. So this last quote here that I've chosen is a gentleman saying, when staff interact with me and take notice of the changes I've made, when they talk to me from a more equal standpoint, it makes me feel like something more than an inmate. It makes me feel like the change is worth it, I guess. Now this, I saved for last because the implications are significant. This person said, when staff talk to me like a human being, it makes me feel as if change is worth it. And what he was talking about was efforts to rehabilitate. What he was talking about was making an effort to not succumb to the environment that he's in, not succumb to the feeling that the narrative, the master narrative was the only option. So what he described was that when he's met from a narrative standpoint with dignity and respect, it propels him to believe that changing his life from the negative things that brought him to prison is an important task. This was a theme that came out of a lot of men who answered these questions. When they experience this narrative recognition, when they experience something as simple as being recognized, it propels them to want to do better. And it's also worth mentioning that they're saying when they experience that from the out group, the person that's considered the enemy, the person that's considered the them and the us versus them. So what this says to me, and what I think the hopefully biggest takeaway from the research is, is that if we just create opportunities for narrative, positive narrative exchange to happen in prison, then we possibly create an avenue for change to be more likely. And I think that these quotes capture the importance of thinking about that theme. So, you know, here at the, at the end of this presentation, I just wanted to say some thoughts about how I feel we can activate voice in the pursuit of better form stories and, you know, coincidentally, in the pursuit of peace and justice.
right? The data and the research that I was able to conduct shows the way that silence is dangerous, the way that it's detrimental, and the way that it's even antithetical to the pursuit of repairing existing harm and preventing future harms. Silence in our prisons specifically is creating this pool of recidivism. It's fueling this process of people feeling like it's not worth going through the processes of change. The invisibility and the coercion are fueling people to feel what is the point. And for a person in a prisoner's predicament, that's a really dangerous feeling to have because it doesn't lead to any positive outcomes. So what we're saying, what the research is saying is that voice is important, right? That the possibility for narrative and story is foundational to the process of rehabilitation. But the data also shows that the power of voice to begin narrative repair and reposition people, even in prison where the us versus them dynamics are extreme, exists, right? So empowering voice and thinking about from the conflict resolution perspective, thinking about how to conduct, for instance, narrative repair workshops, to think about how to get people to tell better stories about their sense of self and their identity even within this environment, even in conflict environments, is still a worthy task. And this last point I'll make here, it's long, I'm gonna read it word for word because I, I didn't wanna lose the message of, of what I was thinking while I was preparing this, this presentation. So what I believe is that we can work towards stopping cycles of silence, which lead to cycles of violence, and simultaneously begin to think about restructuring the purpose of our system. What are we seeking to achieve after crime happens? If the goal is to help restore the dignity of victims, repair the cleavages that have been created and rehabilitate perpetrators so that harms are not perpetuated, then it seems that silence is working against us. We need to pull from other approaches, including restorative justice and conflict analysis and resolution as a field, which are voice and story centered. And we need to chip away at silence at every level. As long as we continue to view punishment as the method that we believe justice is obtained by, then silence will continue to prevail. But when we rethink what we want justice to look like, and when we consider the role that peace has in this pursuit, then we will begin to understand the violence of silence and the power of voice, even for those people that we consider to be other, right? And so I just wanna put out a reminder out there that the data that came out of this study was original, but these theories, they're not original right? The, these, the quotes that I use, they're part of, of fields that are working towards peace and justice. They're, they're part of fields that are working towards long-term prevention of violence and sustainability of peace. And so if we have these fields that are parallel to criminal justice, but that are seeking better outcomes, then why would it not make sense to pull from those fields? Right? Why would it not make sense to take aspects of restorative justice and aspects of conflict resolution and uh, sustainable peace efforts? And those aspects that I'm talking about are voice and story, right? Because it's a thread that exists in every avenue towards peace outside of criminal justice. So I believe that it's very important on the whole field, right? On lawyers, judges, police officers, correctional officers to understand the way that peace I mean that silence is working against peace, to understand the way that silence is working against rehabilitation, and effectively to understand the way that silence is fueling harm and recidivism in our communities, because that's the purpose of a prison, right? We say the purpose of prison is to keep people safe, but the way that we do prison is working against that outcome that we desire. So I, I hope that everybody um, is able to understand, you know, what I said, I tried to pack a lot in here, but I'm, of course, interested in, in conversation and questions that anybody might have. Um, but I, I hope that you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you, Brandon. Wow. My hair is thrown back. Um, I really appreciate the message that you're sending and how you're framing this new way into understanding what's going on in the lived experiences of inmates. It's just not something we have access to. And I truly believe that having you here and 
giving you having the space to tell this story is one step in achieving what you're talking about, right? Your, your facility allowing you to speak to an audience and us as an organization being able to break through that really rigid master narrative, right? And you're like the living embodiment of the work. So thank you so much for sharing with us. And um, I really would love to hear, I know Brandon would love to hear from all of you if anybody has any questions or comments or would like to um, initiate conversation, let's, let's, uh, let's open it up to the gallery. Yeah, and Allison, I actually received a question and I just saw it now. Um, and I'm, I'm, I hope I say the name right. Is it Dalila? Is she, are you still with us? Oh, I don't, I think we have to allow people to unmute, don't we? Um, I don't know, did it, I think we undid that. We didn't undo it, oh. Um, Abby, can you? Um, it's done, it's okay. done. Cool. Well, we're we're just unmuted, we're unmuted. Right. Thank okay. you. I'll, I'll say the question and I'll just offer a quick answer. So the question that was asked was, in your research, have you taken into account the narratives of families with incarcerated family members? And would this fall under the outsider's view on the prison experience? And this is a really interesting question because the answer is unequivocally yes, right? So just as a, um, to, to say one thing first before I answer, one thing I'm extremely interested, you know, as I transition out of prison, as I continue to work on my, um, you know, my dissertation research possibly, is exploring the ways that the violence of silence affects other stakeholders, right? And so exploring the ways that it affects, um, you know, victims, office, police officers, correctional officers, but also the way that it affects family members of incarcerated people, family members of victims. Because my feeling is that silence, it, it, it's, it's almost, um, it, it, it can spread, right? And so I can tell you from my, you know, from my family's perspective, that I'm sure there has been an issue of silence, right? This issue of, of shame that's attached with having a loved one in prison and the way that that shame and that stereotype of who goes to prison and who their family members are probably serves to effectively silence those individuals as well. But to respond more directly to the question, there was a couple people in the, re in, in the interviews that I did who said, you know, point blank, I even feel it difficult to connect with my family, with my loved ones, because they could never possibly understand what I'm going through. But more importantly, because they have this overly stereotypical view of what a prison is and who a prison is and what happens. So some men express that even though I grew up and was raised by my mother and my father and my sister and my brother have known me my whole life, it's as if coming to prison has made them think I'm somebody completely different. Not necessarily because of the crime, but because of the environment, right? So there is this interesting thing where many prisoners feel that even their loved ones and those that they're closest with, the physical barriers that are erected between them has also created this narrative barrier where they are now viewed as outsiders and they don't let them into the entire experience that they're having. So, you know, that's, I think, I hope that answers what you're asking, but it's a, it's a very interesting thing that I, I didn't explore further in terms of writing the thesis, but for sure it's been a backdrop of what I've been thinking about since. Great, we have a question from Wim. Um, Brandon, thank you for a really, really thought provoking presentation. Um, I realize that we don't have a lot of time, so I don't wanna, <clears throat> make this too um, time consuming. There's a number of uh, us in this organization who've um, taught in prisons and so forth. Um, we've had keynotes already delivered by a number of people who um, have taught in prison. And I think one of the things that's on my mind, given um, my experience there um, is to both share and then ask, but I, I'm, I've never been able to do a very good job of learning students' names. When I was in Georgia, I had like 150 or more students per term. And I was like, there's just no way I can do this. Um, but 
but my my inmate um, class, th- they were like, please learn our name. <laughs> we're tired of, of 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 being numbers. And you know, I, I I recall just even that very basic humanizing act as being um, just so central, and that just is such a big theme. Um, but so my question is something along the lines of you're in a facility now where somebody has taken very seriously um, the research that shows which things can help reduce rates of recidivism and so forth. Um, and my experience was that as soon as, so I taught in Georgia, as soon as the news got the data that was our programs were reporting for every dollar in prison education, um, $11 in recidivism costs were saved over a three or five year period. I can't remember which it was, but like, like it was just such a no brainer. Like you save money by doing this. As soon as it got on the news, um, Georgia conservatives were like, we're practically incentivizing people to go get a free college education. Um, and so the, the success of the program was kind of its failure. Um, that's a different kind of silencing of, we don't want people to know that the punishment narrative isn't being played out. And I don't know if you've seen anything about this, come across anything about it, if you have thoughts about it, because this is an area that I'd, I'd really like to go in and I could use your help. Yeah, I, I mean, thanks, Wim. Uh, for such a great, you know, statement and question. And it's interesting, right? Because as a prisoner who's been in, you know, for a pretty significant amount of time, and as somebody who also, you know, I've been in, I've been actively pursuing education since 2009. And I've been able to do it at a level in the state that I'm in that had never been done before. Right. And so I've had a lot of experiences where the news covers graduations and covers, um, you know, events that are shining a light on the college program. And we've all in that in these programs experienced, right, the dichotomous nature of the responses that we get. And for me, it's the great irony about what I've been speaking about through this presentation, right? We say that we want our systems of criminal justice to prevent harm. And yet in the face of the most obvious data, right, you presented fiscal data, I'll present data that people who obtain varying levels of education, your recidivism, your recidivism rate drops, right? When you get your high school equivalency, it drops. When you get your associate's degree, it drops more. Bachelor's, it drops. Graduate mm-hmm. education in the United States of America for prisoners who obtain a, a, a master's degree or higher, less than 1%. So to give that data to society, and then to still experience the outrage that people have that we're educating prisoners, it's antithetical to the process. We want people not to commit more harms when they get out, but like you said, there's this narrative about punishment as a requirement, and not just a requirement, but as the only requirement. And so I believe that exists because of how entrenched this narrative about who prisoners are, who victims are, and what prisoners deserve is in our society. And so it's interesting because what it leads me to believe sometimes is that offering common sense data to the public at large is not where the system is going to improve. So we have to ask, okay, who do we offer this data to? Who do we offer these opportunities to? And my answer to your question, and it's the thing that propelled me towards wanting to do the research, is I don't believe that prisoners and ex-prisoners get involved in that. Because, because of the silence, right? Because of this fear of who people will think that I am when I get out, I don't want to participate in changing the system even though I experienced its violence firsthand. And so I think we have to work on empowering people at the ground level in prison, right? From the grassroots level. To really empower people to understand that yes, you are up against a lot, but you are also the key to making the changes that are necessary. Because once we have, you know, once we have, and I I said this very briefly, but it was a a focal point of part of my thesis. Once we have prisoners as researchers, once we have former prisoners as policymakers, once we have people who have experienced incarceration in positions that matter, then we can start to do real change. 
right? We can start to understand the necessary context that's going to keep people from recidivating. And part of that is understanding narrative, right? So it, it's definitely why I'm getting this education. It's, it's why I'm studying what I'm studying and why I believe in what I believe in is I feel like knowing what I know, I'm okay with sharing my story, even the hard, difficult, stigmatizing parts of it. Because I know that the reason I'm sharing that is to hopefully lessen that burden for other people. It's the reason I wanted to do this research to tell more authentic stories, more unguarded stories that create more narrative complexity for people who are very stigmatized as one thing, right? And so I I'm not sure that there is a good answer to your question other than you know maybe considering the ways that academia and that other people in power can empower people in prison to aspire to more despite the odds that they'll face. And maybe that doesn't mean trying to tell good hearted news stories about them because we know that we're gonna get a polarized response because we live in a polarized society right now. I mean, prisons make sense to be polarized. Look at all the things that we're polarized about that don't make sense. You know, So we have to think about a new approach other than just trying to convince society that punishment doesn't work because for all of history, prisons have been meant to punish. Right, that's, that's what the system was founded on. And so we've created a bigger system, but it's still doing what it was meant to do. And there's a lot of research that says that's what systems will do. So we have to change it from the inside, not from the outside. That's my belief at least. Sure, and also people make money off of prisons existing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we have a question from Global Ops. Yes, it's Linda Groff, thank you. <laughs> I don't know why it says that instead of my name, but anyway. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for your presentation. And I totally get what you're saying is like, to be an authentic person, you have to be able to express yourself. And there needs to be vehicles to do that on the inside and on the outside later. I guess my only thing that came to mind was if you had experience in prison and maybe it could be done outside where you have like group therapy sessions of prisoners where they can really feel at home with each other because they're all prisoners and they, they can be pretty open with each other that that's one vehicle where maybe there could be more expression and opportunities for people to also evolve their own views about their own life and things. Yeah, that's, that's a great question as well. And um, I, I'm not sure it's, I'm not sure it's I, that I spoke about it in the thesis that I wrote, but it's definitely been a focal point of conversation with a lot of people, um, like fellow students and some of my teachers and mentors, is this idea that peer-led programs in prison are the most, um, right? Evidence doesn't necessarily support that they're the best programs, but experience will support that they're the best programs because of exactly what you described, the ability to create the space where people can share more authentically, where people can afford to create a relationship that offers vulnerability that might not exist outside of that, of that space that's peer-led. And so it's interesting because it also draws on this idea of the outsider and of us versus them. And so even volunteers, the most skilled volunteers who aren't necessarily employed by the DOC, even those volunteers who come in on their own time and their own dollar, there's still a hesitancy to truly share with these people. And the reason that that's there is because there's a distrust about what is this person gonna do with this information. And so I think that it's important to think about ways to empower peer-led programs in prison, but it's also important to think about ways to make them matter in terms of within the system, right? Because a peer-led program won't be considered evidence-based because we don't empower the peers to get credentials to do actual um, tr like trackable work, right? So it it's interesting to think that you can't have a prisoner as a mental health professional because it poses obvious concerns but having any mental health professionals other than prisoners poses obvious constraints, right? Mm -hmm. About what's going to be shared and the level of trust that's going to be formed. So it's a, it's, it, I think it's a cultural thing. I think that, again, we've created the story about who prisoners are that are preventing them from obtaining credentials and positions that matter even within their imprisonment to do the work to help people succeed inside and upon release even though we know that peer-led programming is most capable of creating authentic exchanges, right? Okay, so maybe on, when you get out, you can lead an effort to go back in and lead such groups. <laughs> yeah, for, for sure. And that's another- As an part. outsider. Yeah, yeah. That's well, but he still had the experience that the other person has, so it's not like he's a total outsider. I'm kidding. At all. <laughs> 
Yeah. But that's the best alternative, right? I mean, I imagine what a prison would look like where an ex-prisoner is an administrator as well, you know, and understands that the need for the balance between security and safety, but also the need for like bridging some of these divides that exist of us us versus them. And, mm -hmm. and also, I think it's possible for somebody in that position to consider safety and security and consider all of the things that a security minded person needs to consider, but to do it from a framework of understanding the detrimental aspects of being in prison. So it's, it's interesting to think about how resistant we would be to that idea within our systems because of the narratives that are at play. Thank you. Uh, it looks like um, Jose Castell would like to make a comment. Thank you. Um... So in the mid 1980s, um, I was a president of an organization within a religious organization. And um, we, we decided we were going to, uh, we had the opportunity um, to begin to have some visits at uh, one of the local prisons, not, not that local, it was a pretty long drive to get there, but uh, we, we were able to get there in about a half an hour. And we ended up uh, having volunteers from the group would sign up and say, I wanna go to the prison visit next week. And we had, uh, we had monthly visits with them. And at one point we were actually allowed to bring food with us and, 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 and you know, give them some, some food. And we also had um, as part of this uh, meeting with them, uh, a brief uh, religious service, most of the time led by one of the people who were visiting, but there were times when there were actually uh, prisoners who were able to also do that. Um, on our very first visit though, um, what, what, was, what has stuck with me ever since was the gentleman uh, prisoner who actually was able to organize um, these visits. Um, one of the things that he said to us as, as visitors, he said, you know, when you become a prisoner here um, for your own safety and, and, and for your own peace of mind of being in this institution, you, you have to belong to a group. If you, if you, try, to, if you try to be a loner you have to give the impression that you are both willing and able to defend yourself and, 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 and incur serious damage to anyone who tries to mess with you. But most people didn't have that ability. So the only recourse they had was to join a group. So they have a, a group of other prisoners to back them up if anybody tries to 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 um to, to mess with them, so so it, to me it, it was really almost like a system of violence, you know, and and the only way to protect yourself was to actually join one of these groups, um, and I thought that was a pre pretty sad commentary at that time on milit on on on, uh, on prison life. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, we did this for several years. We visited once a month for several years and we had fairly good conversations with the prisoners. Um, uh, they did not give us the kind of information that our, our speaker was able to elicit uh, from his fellow prisoners um, uh, during his research, but we had very good conversations and, um, um, and I felt that they did benefit from our visits, but, um, but I, I, you know, I don't know that um, it had any, any lasting effect. Um, but those are the things that really struck me um, with, when, when we were told that, that, that the prisoners, in order to protect themselves, really had to join a strong group um, for their own protection. So thank you. Yeah, and thank you, Mr. Castell. I can say I was very nervous to present in front of you today. I just want to put out there that Allison made the, the mistake of telling me her parents were coming. So thank you so much for being here. Um, but I also- but I'm, the, I'm the other Dr. Castell, by the way. Okay, Neither. Dr. Castell, thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting to hear your comments because 
there's a couple of things that I want to respond to very quickly. Number one, I can assure you that your visit did have a positive effect because I've been the recipient of many visits like that. And, and to, to boil it down to what my presentation was on, it's an opportunity for narrative repair to begin to occur, right? It's an opportunity to be confronted with somebody from the outside who's taken the time to come inside and, and confront the possible reality that maybe I'm not this monster. Because if you believe that everybody you were going to work with was this irredeemable monster, you wouldn't have gone in. So there is that inherent knowledge for prisoners. And that's why I believe, and th there's also a lot of theory that supports this, right? That exposure between enemy, enemy groups will, will naturally, uh, it'll create a process of rehumanization, right? Because you're, you're, you're having an opportunity to view somebody outside of those master narratives. And so I just wanna say that I can assure you that that was the case. And I also wanna say that it's interesting because it's a delicate process of what an inmate will be willing to offer up right away. Because as the research that I did shows, people feel so constrained by those narratives that to offer up something that's contradictive of that narrative is potentially dangerous for them by, by sending them further into the narrative depending on how it's received. And so it's interesting to hear people talk about the need for groups because it's also important to consider that's a need outside of prison as well, right? We all need to belong. We all need to have an in-group and experience salience within that in-group. And just as a, as a defense mechanism against the emotional damage that loneliness can cause. So it is no wonder that in prison, that dynamic remains, but because the structure of the system is violent by nature, it leads to different meanings and purposes of those in-groups. But I also want to put out there that that's not a universal experience, right? It's a universal stereotype about the experience. And I think it's one that people in every prison across the United States accept, even when it's not necessarily accurate, right? So even in a prison that doesn't experience high levels of violence, you'll hear the story about grouping up to prevent violence. Because just like you all, we've been force-fed stereotypes about ourselves because we have access to television and newspapers and all these other things. So people have begun to adopt the feeling that that's a necessity of being in prison, even when it might not necessarily be the case. So I really appreciate the comments and you sharing that experience. Thank you so much. I have a quick follow-up, Brandon, to that. I just am curious um, if the groups that, you know, they're compelled to, they, you know, prisoners are compelled to join, do they provide any actual in-depth camaraderie or are they merely mechanisms of protection from violence? Like, is there any real um, in-group solidarity support that might have a deeper um, effect or connotation? Yeah, it's an interesting question, right? So some of them, and I'm just gonna talk to you about the stories that I heard, right? Sure. Instead of giving you my, my opinion, because this was something that came up. So a lot of the men who have been in for an extended period of time, 20, 30, 40 years that I spoke with talked about the denigration of group solidarity, right? They spoke about how 20 years ago, the groups that formed were about something different. Maybe they were about the area you were from and you could relate to knowledge about local places and you might know similar people and have shared experiences. Maybe those groups were based on, you know, just even common likes and, um, you know, like sports or music or whatever. And this solidarity was built because of the way that prisons were 20, 30 years ago. Now, one of the things that the men that I spoke to said they feel like has destroyed that feeling of group solidarity is the opioid epidemic, mm -hmm. right? They've talked about how the type of addicts who come to prison nowadays are different than it was 20 years ago. And not just that, that we've flooded our prisons with drug addicts as opposed to treating people. So people come in with these, um, you know, these behaviors that they've learned the, and they come in and they're still pursuing drugs and they're still pursuing all of the things that they were pursuing before. And it's disintegrated the ability to have trust in your fellow inmate, right? So one thing that we, that we talked about, um, that the participants talked about rather was the idea of the convict code, right? This mythical code that supposedly exists amongst inmates. And they talked about what it used to mean and they talked about how it doesn't exist anymore. And in their view, not my view, in their view, it was specific to the epidemics we're facing with, with the opioid crisis. So it's interesting that 
right now in and I'd be I'd be very interested down the road to try to talk to prisoners in a variety of environments across the country, right? And even even in other countries to find out if that's really a fueling factor. Because my hunch is to say that the way that we've um, gotten to this point of mass incarceration is fueling the in the inavailability of solidarity to happen because of the types of people we're putting in prisons and the fact that we're not necessarily treating them the way that we should be in terms of their sicknesses, right? Mental health related sickness, drug related sickness. So we've created this complete lack of trust and this complete inability to build trust within in groups in prison. And that's becoming detrimental to the culture as a whole and the opportunity for rehabilitation. And it's even detrimental to the opportunity for narrative repair to happen because of the distrust of stereotypes and everything else that's being fueled by that. So we're at um, time. It is, it's 6.31. Um, so I, I feel I should bring this to an official close um, and just say thank you so much to you, Brandon, for sharing your insights with us, your knowledge, uh, your experience. Really, this is such a tremendous opportunity. I feel privileged to be able to be here and share this space. And thank you everyone for joining um, and for listening to Brandon's story. And uh, I'd love to give you the, the last word, Brandon. Thank you so much. So if you'd like to have the last word. Yeah, I don't ever want it to end, but I know that it has <laughs> to. So I just want to, you know, I just want to say how humbled I am uh, for this opportunity because I think that you made a very important point earlier right, that this, for me, this is the beginning of a bigger effort, right, it's, it's really great for, for me personally, I, I'm not going to lie about that, it's great to get my research out there to talk about my experiences, and it's a, it's a, it's a step in another direction, but more than that, it's the start of doing the work that I wrote about in my thesis, it's the start of reprogramming these, these stereotypes, and the belief of what inmates are capable of doing, and what their contribution is, may be based on what's available to them, right? So I just wanna say that it's very nice to have this opportunity and know that the work is being done. It's not a hopeless, um, it's not a hopeless feeling anymore, right? I've, ha I've had some unique opportunities to talk about this stuff and talk to a very diverse group of people. And this is another one of those opportunities. So I just wanna say that I'm deeply humbled by the invitation. I'm deeply humbled by everybody who's in attendance. Uh, you know, thank you so much to my classmates and my family for being here. And maybe even more so, thank you to the people who, who have no idea who I am for being here. Because you took a chance to, to hear this from, you know, maybe somebody that you were hesitant about, and maybe you weren't. But I just want to say thank you to uh, PJSA and thank you to all of you. And, you know, be safe and be healthy out there. I know that it's a strange world. And so, you know, my thoughts are with everybody out there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.